you're limited to two items. So what they're stocking in the toilet paper aisle is single rolls. <laughs> you can't buy a package. Excellent. So you can go in, and the most you can get is two rolls. I'm sure there's probably fights, but hey, the rules are the rules. You can only get two rolls. And so I was there tonight, and there's toilet paper. You can't buy 85 fucking packages, but you can get two rolls, and then maybe you go back tomorrow or the next day or whatever you've used them up, and you get two more rolls. Why is this so hard? I am trying to think of anything more hysterically incompetent than a fight at PCC. Oh, fuck, there's fights at grocery stores all over over the yeah, dumbest but, but, shit. But PCC. Like a Walmart fight you can see. I don't think there's ever been a fight at a PCC. But if it did, it'd be awesome in a, in a, in a bad way. Yes. I would laugh my ass it off. It fucking wouldn't be over the toilet paper. You guys are whacking each other with the Birkenstocks. It would, it would be over, you know, some, some vegan patty. <laughs> there's one thing of hemp lip balm left. Oh, Lord. All right, well, anyway. let's do these shows here. The show, singular. Yes. Yes. WWF No See, I don't Way know what Out. day it is anymore. I don't even know where, where, No Way Out? You did watch this one, right? I had a buddy. He said, what, what are you guys watching tonight? I told him No Mercy. Oh. I messed up. <laughs> Luckily, I started watching No Way Out, and I realized it wasn't No Mercy. And I was able to save this poor person from having to watch all of No Mercy and then all of No Way Out. I'm but yes. on No Mercy here. I'll just a spoiler free run of the card on No Mercy, what he almost watched. Uh, look at his dark matches. Oh, it's during the invasion. Hardy Boys versus Hurricane and Landstorm. Test versus Kane. Sorry, he sounds worse. I will tell you, Test and Kane went 10 minutes. Oh, my God. Tori Wilson versus Stacey Keebler. Okay, that's all I need to hear. <laughs> we watched the better show. <laughs> okay. Hey, listen. You know what I got out of this show? I learned something on every show that I watch. What I learned on this show is... These shows are better when they're less than three hours. That's undoubtedly true. I was watching this show, and it was like, the show's two hours and 40 minutes, and it was fucking great. I'd, I'd watch it again without even hesitating. Meanwhile, the last WWE show I watched, I think, was like five hours long, if you count the pre-show. I ain't fucking ever watching that show again as long as I live. Five fucking hours for a show? It's too goddamn long. Too much bullshit and filler. This was boom, 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 boom. Bunch of good matches. There was stuff I didn't like about it. There's too much hardcore shit. Yeah. You've seen one hardcore match, you've seen them all. And I saw all of them, like, fucking four times. But, man, there was good wrestling. The crowd was hot. The crowd was crazy hot. Ah, oh, this was good. Hottest crowd you'll see. Hotter than anywhere in 2020, that's for sure. So, yes, February 25th, 2001, No Way Out. The video package, there's, like... A token 15 seconds to say, yes, Kurt Angle is defending his title against The Rock tonight. But let's talk about Steve Austin and Hunter Hearst Helmsley. That's the real main event. It's made it very clear. The music for the show is a, a, a flagrant ripoff of Machine Head by Bush. And then the, match, the matches begin. The opener, Raven versus Big Show for the hardcore title. So Raven comes out. Out comes the Big Show. And Raven, at this point, still had his ninja. Oh, this ninja. Tori under a mask. The ninja attempts a frontal assault on the big show. Ninjas are supposed to be stealthy assassins. They hide in darkness. They strike from the shadows. This shitty, shitty ninja grabs a two by four and runs up to the big show's face. You'll never guess. The big show saw her coming and stopped her. Well, quite frankly, I'm thinking she's not actually a ninja. She's certainly doing them no favors. I think it's a gimmick. I, th I think she's a, a poor excuse for a ninja. I like to see a better ninja. Not to mention, fuck, it's just one of those WWE things. Like, it's, it's 2001. UFC's been around for eight fucking years. And they've got a ninja. Yeah. <laughs> sure. So they wrestle for like two minutes. Big Show, he did a move in this match that I don't think I've ever seen him do before or since. He basically grabbed Raven and did a jumping World's Strongest Slam. Hmm. I, the one time he did it. So Crash is out there, dressed as a popcorn vendor attacking Raven and Steve Blackman and Hardcore Holly. In the middle of all this mess, and what started as Big Show versus Raven, Billy Gunn pins Raven to win the title. His music plays. The match just keeps going. 
And I think he was attacking people here as the defending champion now. Raven pins him to get the title back. The ninja's back out there. Molly Holly is out there. I'm trying to figure out. So if you can, if it's 24 seven rules and you can pin the new champion right after he's won it, how and when is this event going to end? Well, Vinny, it's funny you mentioned that. I was going to let you keep going, but I'm going to jump in here. So we've been watching this stupid show, and I watched the stupid show today. And as much as I loved this pay-per-view, this match is stupid. Mm -hmm. Because it's 24-7 rules, and today, if there's a match for the 24-7 title, it's not on the line. Except among the competitors. Mm. So if this were 2020, Raven Big Show, nobody would be allowed to run in and win the title during the match. I see. Okay? Mm-hmm. But back then, you could. Yeah. But as I've asked a million times, like when people run in during the match, why do they bring their own ref? Because there's a ref there. Yeah. Well, in this match, they just didn't do that. They just start running in. And so, there's no explanation, by the way, why Crash Holly had to wear a disguise. He runs in in a disguise. Meanwhile, the other guys... Yeah, I'm frankly taking their word it was Crash Holly. They, there was a guy. I'm pretty sure it was. Mm. The other guy's running with no disguise. And so Billy ends up pinning Raven. Yeah. And he pins him, and then it turns into a battle royal. And I, I'm listen, I may be mistaken because I could not possibly give two shits about this stupid fucking thing, but I'm pretty sure that every time somebody got the win, they just kept brawling. Yes. Until finally, the big show got the pin... And they played his music. Mm-hmm. So I guess the music guy determines no, no, no. when I've seen enough. No, Brian, because they played Billy Gunn's music when he won. Did they? And they played Raven's music when he won. Oh, I guess. Well, now, there, 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 there is an explanation. Now, it's stupid. It's not. Let me. I need to clarify this. It's not as if Billy Gunn won the title and then was attacked by somebody from behind. Billy Gunn won the title and jumped up and started punching men. Rather than just trying to leave with his new belt or anything. I, I couldn't it answer any of these questions. Now, I will defend this. There, there, is, there is an explanation. The Big Show eventually chokeslams Raven on a trash can and pins him. His music plays. Billy Gunn goes after him. It goes horribly. Show looks around. Billy's the only one walking, so he posts him. Now Big Show has no challengers left. So He's, because he was the last man standing for the moment, it was over. There was no one immediate, in the immediate wow. area to challenge him, so he left. Yeah. I'll never watch this match again. No, no. If I rewatch the I, paper. I, I would avoid that. So we're kind of going back in time with this show because we have watched two or three weeks of Raw after this show happened. And Kurt Angle, after he dropped the title, is so much cooler as a character because he's a pissed off badass. And I, then we go back and watch this, and it's night and day. This goofball champion, what may as well be a toy belt, gets out of his car. Kevin Kelly comes up, and before he can say anything, Angle says, Hey, are you here to wish me luck? And Kelly says, I'm wondering how you feel about your big match tonight. Which I guess is a question. Angle says, I feel fine. The Rock got a beating on SmackDown. We're here in Las Vegas, which has the highest percentage of losers in the country. Tonight, Rock will be one more loser. I like the pissed off Kurt better. Chris Jericho versus X-Pac versus Chris Benoit versus Eddie Guerrero for the Intercontinental title. We did have a Lillian interview with Benoit and Eddie. Lillian Garcia did a backstage interview. This confused me because we are watching shows after this pay-per-view. Yes. And these men have broken up, so I had to turn my brain off. Mm. Which, by the way, I have to do anytime I see Chris Benoit, especially after watching this fucking dark side of the ring with Chris Benoit. And I've only watched half. Mm. Apparently, if you don't like the first half, the second half is even worse. Dude, I just got to turn my brain off. But I could not help but remember a story from that from that documentary where Vicky Guerrero was talking about when Eddie and Benoit first met each other and they were having these matches in Japan around the J-Cup era. Mm-hmm. They have this footage of Benoit just beating the shit out of this guy. And obviously I never had a match with Chris Benoit, but... Chris Benoit never had the rep of as someone that would hurt you. No. Okay. So I always thought, fuck, his stuff looks good, but I mean, you know, I'm sure he lays some stuff in, but, you know, he's just a really great worker. He's mostly just, you know, well, apparently he beat the shit out of you. He didn't hurt you, but he beat the shit out of you. Because Eddie used to call his wife and tell her about this fucking asshole Chris Benoit that he hated to work. 
And meanwhile, they're showing all this footage of Benoit just powerbombing this poor fucker into oblivion. I saw that a lot. And of course, the weird thing about it is they eventually became best friends. Yes. And everything that Eddie hated, they still kept doing when they were friends. Yes. Like Benoit's on Nitro giving this guy the hardest fucking powerbomb you ever saw. And it's like, this is a weird business. But anyway, they're in here and they do some spots together and... You know, after watching all of this footage of these two guys in the mid-90s, and then, like, two days later, I watched them here in 2001, they're still fucking such great pro wrestlers, but boy, are they slower. Especially Eddie Guerrero. He's probably 30 pounds heavier than he was in 1995, maybe more, and he can still do all of his stuff, but they did, like, the backdrop into the Hurricane Rana, and it was just slower. And he's only going to slow down from here on out because he just keeps getting bigger. Yeah. But they had a hell of a match, all four guys. This was when there was there's a, a, a basic theme to this match. When there was four guys in the ring doing his stuff or sometimes three guys in the ring doing his stuff, it was an okay wrestling match. When two of them took breaks on the floor so the other two could do stuff in the ring, it was a very good wrestling match. Benoit and Eddie were great together. Benoit and Jericho were great together. So... Jericho makes a big comeback, does the spot where he puts one guy in the walls, lets him go to put another guy in the walls, etc. However, he releases X-Pac to go attack the interfering Just Incredible. And then a bunch of stuff happens at the end that didn't need to happen. X-Pac and Just Incredible yank Benoit out of the ring. So I'm thinking, okay, he's done for the match. And then like a minute later, Benoit's in the ring doing stuff. So I don't know why they bothered with that stuff. Credible interferes a lot, keeps getting knocked off the apron or whatever. There's a big melee, and somewhere Jericho pins X-Pac with a roll-up. You know, it's funny, and I think some hardcore fans... Actually, the hardcore fans aren't even listening to this show, so fuck off. What's funny about this show is... And I mean, like, the hardcore WWE diehards. Oh, sure, yeah. Like, this okay. is their only life. Yeah, not so like I like understand. the hardcore fans are listening to this, but not the WWE diehards. I understand. Because yeah. they think I'm mean. being paid by AW. Yeah, yeah. But anyway, the thing that I noticed here is that there's an instance in this match... And there's an instance later that's even better. These fans watching this pay-per-view cared. Oh, God, yes. Oh, that's, yes. They cared about who won and who lost. Yes. Now, the WWE diehards would tell you that they care nowadays, but they don't. What they are, they are, they are conditioned to be participants in the match. And they know to cheer, they know to boo, they know when both guys fall down, they chant, this is awesome. They know when somebody kicks out of a finish, they cheer. But it's, it's, it's like, it may as well be piped in. Sure. It's always exactly the same. Yeah. Because there's no real passion, except on very rare occasions. Like when Daniel Bryan always got beaten, you know, people were mad or whatever. But uh, very rarely do people really care because... They also know that none of this shit matters. It doesn't matter to Vince. He's going to 50-50 everybody. You know, everybody's going to get a belt, and then you, the fan, will chant, you deserve it. It's just like, nothing means anything. Yeah. They do this fucking match, and we all know about X-Pac heat. It was a real thing. Oh, yeah. It was not a Pavlovian thing where you boo him. Like, you know, people started to boo John Cena because it was part of the show. And then people were booing Roman Reigns, even when they couldn't even remember why they didn't like the guy. These people fucking hated X-Pac. Mm-hmm. So there's a spot in this match where X-Pac hits Jericho with a low blow, and he hits the X-Factor. And you can just hear, it's not the whole crowd, but it's like probably 30% of the people, they're fucking furious because they think it's over, and X-Pac is going to win this match over these other three guys. They are furious. And Chris Benoit rushes in and breaks it up. I'm just watching it going, they care so much. Mm -hmm. They hate this man so much that it's actually really going to bother them if he wins this match. Not like the Twitter fury nowadays where, oh, if if Brock beats Drew McIntyre, I'm canceling the WWE Network. I'm going to put my hashtag on Twitter. These are actually... Furious people that a man is going to win a wrestling match. And we saw it again later, and it was even better. Keep all this in mind when we get to the main event, by the way. 
We get footage of Hunter getting his fists taped. We have William Regal having a meeting with Vince. So... <laughs> Regal's the greatest. Regal's, Regal and Vince actually are the greatest. Well, we, they're both the greatest because it's a worked... What you're going to say is a worked story, mm -hmm. but you may as well just close your eyes and imagine this is an actual meeting between Vince McMahon and, and one of his performers. Yes. So the storyline is Regal's walking a very fine line. He, he, he does not want... He's on, in danger of making Vince McMahon angry, but he also has a chance to make Vince McMahon happy. And now Vince is there, and of course, he's Vince. He can never just say what he wants. He just has to let him... He, he lets Regal know that the uh, stakes are high. He explains, you know, Regal, this match tonight between Stephanie and Trish was your idea. You realize Stephanie is my precious daughter, daddy's little girl, and you realize Trish is... Is my very good friend. Now, since this match was your idea, I'm confident you'll know what to do. And when the time is right, you'll know exactly what to do. And Regal, like, nods nervously. And Vince leaves. And Regal, just in case... The, the, just to, to stop them from doing one subtle segment ever, Regal says out loud, I don't know what to do. How the bloody hell am I supposed to know what to do? <laughs> but... Normally, I would be upset that they have to, like, spoil the joke or make it patently obvious what's going on. But Regal is so good mm -hmm. that I loved him doing that. Regal is great. He's the best. Yeah. Buster Rhymes is at WWF New York. Sadly, he did not speak. Test did. They ask him about this upcoming match between Stephanie and Trish. Does he have a prediction for this match? He knows them both very well. And Test is like, well, usually, usually I like watching women roll around. This time we'll just find out who the biggest trash bag hoe in the WWF is. I was not blown away by this test promo. Mm. Regal attempts to talk to Trish before the match. She blows him off. We are told Monday Night Raw is only available on TNN. And if you don't get it, you must call your cable company and demand it. Mm. Different times. Trish Stratus versus Stephanie McMahon Helmsley. Holy shit. I was told this match was good. This match was a fucking miracle. Yes, I use that word myself. So here's the thing. We watched the Raw after this, the next night. When they had an abomination. They did a horrible match. Yes. And then we were told this match was good. So I, I had that in my mind as we began watching. And for the first half, I was like, okay, this is a thousand times better than that Raw match. And given who's in there, it, it, it's perfectly acceptable, but I certainly wouldn't call it good. And then, like, halfway through, Trish takes this big bump off the top rope to the, to the end of the ring. And they start brawling outside. Stephanie grabs the pitcher of water the announcers have and douses Trish with it. And Trish is outraged. And the fans are gasping. I was like, okay, this is good shit. Dude, so when this started, I watched the first few minutes and I thought, you know what? This is, this is good. I mean, maybe standards are different today. Because, like, we've seen so much awful shit in Impact, and there was, actually was TNA, but... And then, you know, the women's evolution. Like, some of the women are great, but there's some terrible women in WWE having awful matches. This is actually pretty good. I don't know how it was in 2001. Standards are probably higher. But, man, this is good. They keep going. And this is Trish Stratus, who never even really had... Any legitimate, lengthy, real training. Same with Stephanie really, McMahon. Yeah. Yeah. And they're in there, and it was like the first match. I, I mean, I, I'd have to go back and watch SmackDown and Raw again. But I mean, as far as like us going back and watching, this is the first match where I can see, well, fuck. Yeah, fuck, she sure did end up really good. Like, she was really good in this match. And she only got better. Stephanie pretty much stayed the same her entire career. Obviously, this thing was intricately scripted for these two. Moment for moment. They probably practiced it a million times, but, like, everything they did was good. Stephanie did a... I swear to God, Trish goes for a fucking hurricane run, and Stephanie power bombs her, and it was, like, perfect. It was so good. This is another one, by the way. Uh, Trish gets a wedgie. She starts yelling at the ref, and as she's yelling, she fixes her trunks. Fans were furious. 
They were so angry. They start booing the match because she fixed her, as, as Paisley would call it, her veggie. Oh. Paisley's got a Leo, mm. and she's always saying, I've got a veggie. Mm. But anyway, so they do this match, and they do this double down, and Regal runs down. And if you know where the storyline is going, at first you're like, what the fuck's going on? He goes down, and he puts Trish on top of Steph. Yes. But then when the ref counts, he puts Steph's foot on the rope. He's conflicted. So Trish yells at Regal. She slaps him. He hits her with the neck breaker, and he throws Stephanie on top to get the pin. Now, I know you say he's conflicted, but, like, wasn't the actual storyline that him and Vince were in it the entire time? Um, or is it just Vince and Steph that were in it the whole time? I'm not even sure. I think the storyline is that Vince, I don't know if he was in on it. I think he just, over the next 24 hours, comes to the, real, comes to the realization this thing with Trish, with Trish has run its course. I presume that they're in on it together. Because otherwise, Vince should have told the guy what he wanted him to do. Well, or no, 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 because as we noted, that's a Vince McMahon thing. It's a he, test. It's a test. He he mm. wanted he maybe Vince knew what he wanted. Maybe he knew what maybe Steph knew what Vince wanted, but neither of them told Regal. And they had they wanted to see where Regal stood. Mm. So that's what happened. So so a couple of keys to this. First of all, at no point. Forget the athleticism and physicality that that was also very impressive compared to what we've seen from these two women in 2001. There is not a single solitary second in this match where there's a deer in the headlights moment. They have great poise. And every time there's a close-up of their facial expressions, it's not like they're wondering what to do. It's not a blank stare. They're pissed off at each other the whole time. And when Steph goes to pick her up, she doesn't just bend over and grab her by the head. She rears her claws back up like a lion and grows down and grabs Trish by the skull. Just little stuff like that that matters. And then when this is all done, I'm going back over my head is like, so Trish was still barely a wrestler, but obviously a very talented athletic person. Stephanie was barely a wrestler and not talented athletically. But then I realized how little they actually asked Steph to do. I'm not 100% sure she took a bump in this match. I'm pretty sure she did not hit the ropes. She they had some spots planned where she would throw Trish around or powerbomb her or whatever. But for the record, or for, for, for the most part, they didn't ask her to do anything she was bad at doing. Great. So not only is this a much better match than you would expect going in, this is like a, a teaching moment. Wrestlers should watch this to learn how to do a match with minimal bumping and rope running. Yes. And just make the stuff you can do matter. So this is the report from the next night on Raw, which we watched weeks ago. So the match was, it was Regal and Steph versus Vince and Trish. They botched the spot, and both Regal and Vince are aghast. Oh, yes, yes. Trish tags in Vince. He gets in the ring with his daughter. Stephanie runs to tag Regal, but Regal drops off the apron. Yes. And then he comes back with the slop. So they were in on it. Yeah, at this point, they were clearly all in on it. Yes, yeah. yes. Well, Regal was not in it, apparently, at this point, because he goes backstage after the match. Unless this was also part of the swerve. It may have been part of the swerve. Vince is very, very unhappy with the Regal. I thought you knew what I wanted. Have I got to do everything myself? And yes, Brian, he booked himself and Trish versus Regal and Steph for Raw. Because on Raw the next night, there is a, there is a meeting backstage before the match where Regal is trying to talk sense into Vince, and Vince is furious at him, in air quotes, and says, the match is on! So that, for sure, was a swerve. I think it dates back to this match right here. I think they were all in it together. That's why when Regal put Trish on top, then he put Steph's foot on the ropes. Because mm. he knew that Stephanie was not supposed to lose. So it was an elaborate 24-hour plot just to make Steph yes. or Trish look dumb. Yes, <laughs> yes. Steve Austin versus Triple H, and I, I believe they call it three stages of hell. Yes. So it's a two out of three falls match. Where the first fall is a wrestling match. The second fall is a street fight. And the third fall, if necessary, as Jim Ross is the only one to point out, is a cage match. They will do these matches every couple of years. And by and large, they forget the if necessary part. They just tell you it's going to go three falls, which kills the drama of the first and second fall. But this one, Jim Ross made it clear, the third fall, if necessary, will be a cage match. So we have a really good pro wrestling match here in the first fall. 
Hunter's working the leg, using the figure four, wrapping around the ring post, all that. He is able to avoid the Stone Cold Stunner twice. But when he comes off the middle rope or something, Austin boots him, hits him with a stunner, wins the first fall. This was over. I was like, man, that was fast. I looked up. It, it was, was not fast. It was 12 minutes. They did 12 minutes at a very, very fast pace. Hunter's frantically screaming spots from the opening bell. There's a lot of that. He's calling the whole match. Elbow! Hunter is, is, I mean, both of these guys, Austin in particular, always just works his ass off. But these guys are just boom, boom, boom. No stopping it. No. And I'm thinking, dude, you guys you guys are going 40 minutes. Mm-hmm. I'm like, what the fuck are you going so fast for? But they just, they had a sprint. They kept going. And then they kept going in the second fall, which was the street fight. Yes. And this was the... Funny thing about this is, the second fall is a street fight, and the third fall is Hell in a Cell. And obviously, Hell in a Cell is supposed to be the really scary one, because Mick Foley nearly killed himself doing it. It's a case but match. But the fact of the matter is... In the second fall, like, they did the exact same stuff in the third fall, except they had to stay in the ring. Yeah. The second fall was way more exciting. It was, yes. They're brawling around ringside. They, they, they immediately, that second fall, nothing in the second fall resembled the first fall. No, there's there suplexes on the ramp, barbed wire board, they're both bleeding, Austin takes the board to the head. They go through the table on the floor, hit each other with the monitors, Austin grabs a steel chair and just destroys Hunter with it in the ring. Just smashes him with it. There's the two-by-four. The tribute to Mick Foley is there. They use every violent gimmick in the world. Steps, tables, announce tables, chairs, but the most dangerous weapon of all. Let me stop you right there. Let me stop you right there. So, Hunter gets the sledgehammer. That's my point. Oh. uh, The most dangerous weapon of all is a fucking sledgehammer. Of course it is. Which, granted, is a dangerous weapon. Sure. But they're fucking... Those steel steps are allegedly 300 pounds. Sure. So, it's funny you mention the most dangerous weapon being the sledgehammer. Because I'll repeat the finish, basically, of the first fall. Austin failed at the stunner twice, but on the third time, he hit it and he won. So, Hunter gets the sledgehammer. And... Poetically, he fails the first two times he tries to use it, but then he hits it with a third time. And I'm thinking, what a great finish. What a great callback to that first oh, no! Poetic justice. What a fool Vincent Verhey is, because, of course, the real most dangerous weapon in wrestling, Brian, is the pedigree. Yes. And Hunter must hit his move to win this fall. Not only that, the third fall, Hunter at one point... Kills Austin with a chair shot. Third fall, they really were slowing down. Yes. They were going at a fast clip. The, the fir- it, first fall went about 12 minutes. The second, about 16. So already a half hour into this. So and, they're they're mostly just, you know, putting a barbed wire board on each other's head. Yeah. But Hunter gets his chair. And, well, first, Hunter hits a pedigree and Austin kicks out. So Hunter gets his big steel chair and he fucking waffles Steve Austin with a steel chair. And then he lifts him up because he needs to do the pedigree. <laughs> To which point, Lawler finally just says, clearly this guy wants to send a message using his finish or using a pedigree or whatever. Like, damn straight, he must win he with his did. move. Which, ironically, he didn't. In the end, he did not. They, they both kicked out of the finishers here. And the finish is, Hunter grabs his sledgehammer. Well, hold on, I gotta talk this finish. This is the other one I was talking about. All right. So, Hunter's got the sledgehammer. Steve Austin has the barbed wire board. They both rush at each other. And Hunter hits him with the sledgehammer just as Austin hits Hunter with the barbed wire board. Mm -hmm. So Steve Austin bumps first. And Triple H is still on his feet, but he's, he's wobbling and he's about to go down. The fans start to fucking... I'm not making this up. They start to scream. Like, the women scream for the fucking Von Erichs. But I think there are men actually screaming as well. Because it's like to these fans, time suddenly stood still. They see Steve Austin on the mat, on his back, and they see Hunter wobbling at the edge of the cliff over him. And they start screaming because they all know what's going to happen. And they can't believe they're going to see it. And sure as shit, Hunter falls off that cliff and he lands 
on Steve Austin. And the referee counts the pin. And this Triple H, quadruple H, he beats Stone Cold Steve Austin, who is the number one contender for the title at WrestleMania. Now, if Hunter wasn't on a fucking reign of terror, it's a great finish because you're setting up a challenger for after Steve Austin wins the title. Mm -hmm. But this fucking guy had run roughshod for two years now, beating everybody with his move. No matter what, the one heel that won clean with his move over everybody. The first heel in the history of the company to win the main event at WrestleMania. And here is their hero, Steve Austin. He's on his way to WrestleMania, hopefully against The Rock, and they all of a sudden see that Hunter is going to fall on him and pin him. Yeah. And they're screaming! I loved it. <laughs> I loved how much everybody cared. I fucking am, I was laughing my ass off because Hunter beat Steve Austin on the show before WrestleMania. I mean, it's just, of course he did. But like, fuck, they cared so much. Which, by the way, goes to show why it was so fucking stupid a month later that they turned this guy heel. Yes, this, this is the biggest key to me. I'm trying to watch this in a vacuum. Obviously, I know very well what happens here and in the next several months. But I'm trying to watch this in a vacuum. Austin is about to main event their biggest show of, of the era at the Astrodome. He's going to win the title there. Hunter, okay, I'm not going to say he needed the heat, but Hunter can now straight up say, Austin, he can come out on Raw the night after Mania and say, Austin, I beat you at No Way Out. I am now the top contender, and they can go from there. That's the opposite of what actually happened. What actually happened was Steve Austin turns heel at Mania, and soon he and Hunter are pals. Yes. And if Hunter hadn't torn his quad, maybe we wouldn't have been pals the whole year. <laughs> Who knows? So, yes, in context, especially with, with, with the benefit of hindsight of what happens the rest of the year, this makes zero sense. On this night, in a vacuum, even though the body of the third fall is like completely anticlimactic and unnecessary, when you take all 40 some minutes as a package, it is a great. Oh, yeah, great it's a great match. match. It's a war. This, great. this was a war. And then, of course, Austin hits a stun or two. Send the, send the fans home happy midway through the show. Jerry Lawler versus Steven Richards. Oh, my God. Where if Lawler wins, Cat gets to get naked. And if Richards wins, Cat must join the right to censor. Taz comes out to join the announce desk. No mention of his history with Lawler and Ross. He's just out there calling matches now. They had a very average TV match. Richards grabs a chair. Lawler hits a low blow and a couple of DDTs. Let's not gloss over this, Vinny. Jerry Lawler was better than at least 50% of this roster. Okay. He was so good in this match. And not only that, Jerry Lawler is fighting for his real-life girlfriend. Okay, but... In storyline, he's just fighting for this hot girl because she wants to take her clothes off. He's the biggest baby face on the show. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, the idea is, well, we got to beat him. We must beat Jerry Lawler because Cat is going to join the RTC. So, like, I mean, come on. Everybody knows what the finish would be in 2020. Jerry Lawler gets distracted and he gets pinned like a fucking idiot. Okay. What happened in this match? Well, Steven tries to use the chair behind the ref's back, but no. Lawler thwarts him, hits a low blow, and a DDT. Ivory takes the ref. Cat tries to hit the ring, and the ref is getting rid of her, and as this happens, Steven Richards grabs the belt. He tries to hit Lawler with the belt, but he misses. Ivory hits the ring, Slaps Lawler or whatever. Lawler gives her a big body slam. The referee goes to get rid of Ivory, and Stevie grabs the belt. Again. And he goes to hit Lawler, and Lawler thwarts him again. It's fucking Superman. 
It's a real life superhero. Finally, Cat grabs the belt. She tries to hit Steven, but she accidentally hits Jerry Lawler, and he is beaten and pinned. Jerry Lawler did not look like a fucking idiot. He did not look like a fool. He thwarted the heels over and over and over again until Stacy was the one who screwed up and waffled him with the belt, and he got pinned, and now because of her mistake... She must join the RTC. When this was over, I was like, can you just fucking give this guy the book? Why isn't this fucking guy booking Raw and SmackDown? You know what I'm saying? Like, if the XFL moves to Saturn and Vince has to leave the planet, he's going to be gone for a long time, and somebody else has to take over, fucking give it to Jerry Lawler. I have more faith in this guy than anybody at this point. Fuck, this was good. And his punches. Holy shit. Well, of course, Jerry Lawler as a pro wrestler remains untouchably great. See, I saw all this stuff going on with Lawler thwarting them over and over again. The fact that Steven Richards tried to use the belt twice, and the exact same thing happened both times. He swung the belt. Yeah, because he's a bumbling moron. He swung the belt. Lawler ducked and hit a low blow, I think. But it led me to think, like, Cat was out of position and was supposed to do something. Well, maybe she was. It looked... I, th- I thought it looked sloppy. But at the end of the day, the fools were the heels over and over again. Not the baby face. Although Stacy screwed up. Stacy in the end was. But she wasn't the superhero. She was the underling. That's true. Michael Cole interviews the Brothers of Destruction. He points out they have never won the tag titles. And Taker interrupts him. Well, I want to mention, by the way, that when he said that, I'm like, they have both won the tag titles four times, just never together. I see. Yes. Yeah, well, that's actually a valid point. But before you can even get any farther, Undertaker has to explain, and this is actually amazing to think about considering what happens in this match. The match is about the gold, but we are about pain and suffering. There's going to be six individuals in this match, and four of them are going to learn what it means to be in our yard and those four men should not concern themselves with the tag team titles. They should concern, them, concern themselves with how they're going to survive. And then Kane says something about how he's going to put all four dudes through hell. It leads to, in a tables match, Dudley's versus Edge and Christian versus the Brothers of Destruction. Kane, in the only time I can remember, is wearing an all-black outfit. I don't see any red in this anywhere. So, he was very charred. Apparently, <laughs> extra crispy cane tonight. Yes. So we have already seen a multi-man match tonight. Actually, two of them. We have already seen a lot of hardcore wrestling tonight. Dude, this it was a hardcore all, stuff. This all felt so done to death already. Ugh. It wasn't bad. But no, it just we've, we've seen it up and down the show. And the fans, the fans loved it. So, I mean, whatever. But to me, I was so sick of people hitting people with shit. Yes. Over and over again. I was over it. So it goes on for a while. Eventually, the crowd did die out. Jim Ross, at least twice in this match, mentioned that Edge and Christian were being, quote, battered and fried. That's a new one. So they keep doing near falls in a tables match where somebody's going to get, like, chokes into the table and somebody else flips it over. And, like, every single time the table didn't quite get over, I'm terrified someone's going to hit the edge or just get impaled on a leg. Thankfully, no one ever did. And finally, the Dudleys both get choke slammed. They're taken out. The Brothers of Destruction, as you would expect, are dominant. They are about to hit twin choke slams through tables and win when Rikishi and Haku attack. And the Islanders and the Brothers of Destruction brawl up the ramp. Edge and Christian and the Dudleys are left in the ring. Edge hits a table in the corner. The table doesn't break. And I don't know if that was the plan finish or not, but what I do know is the table was there and the Dudleys just grabbed Christian and 3D'd him through a table and won. And they go to the top of the ramp where Kane and Taker were like, well, fuck, (laughs) we should have won this match. So in the end, this was boring, it was repetitive, it was needless, and it buried the winners of the match and their top challengers by making the real premium, premium team in the division seem too important for the titles. Taker and Kane versus Haku and Rikishi is much more important than the actual tag team champions when all was said and done here. So the thing I want to talk about here kind of has to do with the match, but it's just three ways in general. I wish that when AEW started and they had the opportunity to create whatever rules they wanted, because it's their fucking company, they can do whatever they want, 
this goddamn no DQs in a three-way is fucking stupid. Or a four-way. It's been done for a long time. Like, it's an easy way out of these interferences and shit like that. But, like, as a viewer, it's a fucking dumb rule. I know people go, well, you can't do a DQ in a three-way because then who wins? Well, no one wins. If you're in a three-way, you get disqualified, you're out of the goddamn three-way, and now it's a singles match. Yeah. If you're in a four-way, and your fucking buddy runs in, you're DQ'd, and you're out of here, and now it's a three-way. There are all kinds of sporting That's events. the most logical way to handle yeah. this three-way, four-way, five-way rule. This deal where, well, because it's a three-way, there's no DQs. It's just, it's just stupid because, why the fuck doesn't everyone run in? Well, that's if I got question. a faction of four people, okay? If I got four underlings, you, Craig, Rob, that's my horseman. Okay? Y'all ride ponies? If I have a match... Have you seen me and Craig? And it's a three-way... We're not riding ponies. You are the horse. That's closer than riding a pony. Okay. So, if I have a fucking three-way coming up, and you're my posse, you're my homies... Sure. Okay? That goddamn bell rings, you're in the fucking ring. Yeah. And the four of us are going to beat the shit out of everybody. And if that doesn't happen, I'm stupid. So... I watch these matches, and it's like people come out, and they wait on the outside. You know, they wait for their turn to interfere. It's like, this is so dumb. It insults my intelligence. The rule's stupid. Just like somebody somewhere, please, change the rule to there are fucking DQs in a three-way and a four-way and whatever, and if you get disqualified, you're just out of the goddamn match, and the rest of the match continues with the other guys. Stupid rule. Main event is Kurt Angle versus The Rock. Excellent match. And I don't want to say... The crowd is certainly not dead for this show. But as soon as this match begins, the intensity of the, of the heat just cranks up many, many, many degrees. And hey, listen. I don't want to bury anybody on this show. And I don't want to bury anybody today. But in 2001, Steve Austin and The Rock were the two biggest stars on the planet. And two of the richest these motherfuckers worked so hard. Sure, yeah. They fucking worked. They, there was no going through the motions. There was no doing the same match you do every night. Yeah, there were a lot of the same spots. But they worked so fucking hard. And obviously, Kurt Angle always works hard. And guys like Benoit, I mean, there was they had one gear. Jericho, Eddie. But I mean, Rock and Austin. Right up there. They didn't need to. Right. But they did. Because they were... All-time greats. So they're having this great wrestling match. What's funny to me is that Angle cut him off almost immediately. The first half of this match was like all Kurt Angle. And he starts throwing this, you know, this pristine, beautiful, elegant, overhead release belly-to-bellies to a man who is much bigger than him, by the way. Kurt Angle is not a giant. And Jim Ross, who ordinarily is just a great wrestling announcer, that says, that's almost like, uh, almost a Greco-Roman-like throw. Okay, <laughs> it's a it's a belly to belly suplex, Jim. So I'm loving this. It's great, and then the Rock hits a DDT, and out comes the Big Show with his fucking music. With his music, that was the dumbest part. They played his you music don't say. for the entrance and when he left. <laughs> Not even just his entrance music. <laughs> After that. he did his move, they played his music again, and he left. He comes out and he choke slams the referee. Well, this is bullshit. He chokeslams Kurt Angle. He grabs The Rock, and because it's The Rock... Maybe once he got in the ring, it was a three-way, so he didn't get DQ'd for chokeslamming the ref. I hadn't thought of that. Fuck. I hadn't thought of that. It, it, maybe because he's the hardcore champion. All of his matches are 24-7. Sure. Yeah. He chokeslams The Ref. He chokeslams Angle. He chokeslams The Rock, and there is a pause. And I was certain Rock was going to at least escape this chokeslam the first time. But no. Show grabbed him. Rock is a very big man, and Big Show lifted him high, high, high into the air and held him up there and chokeslammed him to death. It was awesome. And then the Big Show leaves. I'm not sure what his goal was. I have no idea what his goal was. It leads to nothing. I can tell you that much. I don't know what this had to do with anything, and for a long time, this ruined the match for me. Now, so all the men are down, both wrestlers and the referee. Other refs come t tend to the first ref when The Rock 
grabs the championship belt and hurts hits Kurt Angle with it and hurts Kurt Angle with it and makes a cover. I stuttered when I said hits, but no, I, I got the names right. The Rock is the one who cheated first. And you actually could hear scattered boos yeah. when he did it. It's bizarre. Regardless, Angle kicked out like a true hero. The match just eventually continues. We all ignore this five minutes in the middle where it was chaos and insanity. And the the crowd was completely into it. They were totally, totally, totally into it. So eventually a turnbuckle gets exposed. Angle hits the exposed buckle. Rock hits the rock bottom and makes a cover. The ref counts one and the ref counts two. And then he just stops counting. And we are told... It's fucking Earl Hebner screwing the man again. We are told Angle is kicked out. I don't think he did. He did not kick out. You could see the people in the front row on that side were screaming at Earl, furious. So they just get up and Rock hits him with a rock bottom. No, no, no. So Earl fucks up. And so Rock stands up. He lifts Kurt up. He fucking slams him with the rock bottom. And then he shoots Earl a look of death. Yeah. Earl drops down, and he counts to three. This fucking match is over. And I had just watched Raw from Monday, where the ref screwed up the finish on Monday. Oh, how about that? That was two nights in a row. I had to watch one of these refs. It's like, what the fuck are you doing? Just count to three. I guess he thought Angle was going to kick out of that rock bottom. So the first it half... It wasn't a pedigree, after all. That's true. That's true. The first half of this match was excellent. There's a lot of bullshit in the middle. And I, I had trouble getting back into it in the second half. But you know what, Brian? But you know what? The people- and, and the finish was botched. <laughs> the, the finish, finish was botched. botched. But the but people it, loved it. It didn't matter. Yes. Because the people loved The Rock so much. And they wanted him to win so badly that as long as he hit his move and the rough counter three and he held that big shiny gold belt up high, they were so happy. It was like a sporting event where the home team won. They didn't want to see The Rock perform they did not want to see the rock sports entertain they wanted to see the rock win win and they got their money's win the gold belt and hey i loved it it is funny that all those years of building up wrestlemania main events for months and months and months here they are just (laughs) giving the guy the title a month before yeah we're gonna do a one month build for the biggest match of all time yes i don't know not my company anyway that was it what a great show. That was a very good show. Yes. Watch this show, everybody. Two thumbs up. An easy thumbs up. Yes. Yes. All right. Well, that's it. Uh, Vinny's going to be at home for the next two weeks, at least two weeks.